Hello and welcome to week 15 of PubH610. This is the last week of the semester and today we will discuss the future of health services delivery. The learning objectives for this week are to broadly understand the forces of future change in the healthcare system and how they interface with healthcare delivery. We also want to discuss how we assess healthcare reform in transition in the United States, the evolving healthcare delivery infrastructure, and the progress we're making towards population health outcomes, the skills mix which will be needed in the future, that includes nurses, physicians, and other health workers. And lastly, we'll discuss some new frontiers in clinical technology. Predicting the future is impossible. It's anyone's guess right now who will win the next presidential election and how the future of healthcare will be affected. But some aspects of the ACA have gotten us to this point in history. In spite of the employer and individual mandates in the ACA, employer-based health insurance has eroded. The main beneficiaries of the ACA were those who obtained coverage through the Medicaid expansion. 11 million people gained coverage in this way in 2016. That is if you were lucky enough to live in a state that did expand coverage. There were also people who were able to purchase coverage in the government-sponsored exchange, and they received a federal subsidy to do so. So in essence, the government gave people money to pay for their health insurance. 12 million people enrolled in a plan on an exchange in 2016, and 10 million of them received a subsidy. And then lastly, adults under the age of 26 were allowed to stay on their parents' plans, and some 4.5 million people gained insurance through this provision. But all, as we've previously discussed in this semester, the ACA, while it did help to reduce the number of uninsured, there were still many Americans who were left without coverage, and many others who continued to face high healthcare costs and had difficulty accessing services. And there were also people who continued to face challenges in obtaining high quality care. In this lecture, we'll discuss where we go from here and the future of healthcare in a national and global context. Your text presents a framework to help us understand why certain changes have occurred in the past and inform the direction of change that might occur in the future. There are eight forces included in the framework shown here. This framework can be applied to something macro, like the future of US healthcare delivery, or by healthcare executives to craft strategies for their organizations to change with the times. These eight forces interact in complicated ways and change over time, with some becoming more dominant than others. For instance, for decades our healthcare system has not been driven by market forces, in other words, economic forces, because the government became a major player in healthcare financing and delivery when President Johnson created Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. Despite the government's large role in providing healthcare in the U.S., the private sector also still plays a major role in healthcare, and how we cut out the private sector, which is so deeply entwined in providing care and insurance coverage is still being debated. As we discussed earlier in this semester, our population is aging. We're getting older, and therefore, there are more of us living longer with high cost health conditions. We have a serious problem with how we're going to provide long term care in this country. Our current coverage by Medicare and Medicaid is patchwork at best, and since many Americans don't have long-term care insurance and may live far from family members who can care for them, people are left with difficult decisions about where and how they age. Regarding economic forces, one-third of Americans report struggling to get by financially. Household incomes from middle-income families 
especially determine if healthcare is affordable and household incomes depend on the nation's economic health and quality of employment. The fact that one third of Americans are struggling financially and more than one fifth of Americans are working multiple jobs, doing informal work for pay in addition to their main job or both, and these positions often don't provide health insurance. These facts raise questions about the affordability of health care, our nation's economic health, and the quality of employment in this country. There are a lot of debates about the federal debt, but one thing isn't debatable. The federal debt has been growing and is projected to continue to grow. Political forces and public policy affect almost all aspects of healthcare delivery. Policies that affect education, as well as policies on immigration, can determine the number and qualifications for our future healthcare workforce. Policies about Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement can determine what kinds of care are being provided and the quality of that care. At the moment, our country is divided over many important policy issues, including health care. For instance, should the ACA be repealed and replaced? If you ask different people from different political parties in different parts of the country that question, you'll get very different answers. While politicians largely, largely control these important public policies which impact our health care, we must remember that we as voters control the politicians who sit in these offices. Regarding technology, it's widely agreed that tech innovation will continue to revolutionize healthcare in the future. We as Americans favor ongoing innovation, availability, and use of new technologies. However, the unrestrained use and development of new and expensive technologies raises questions about cost control and what benefits we're getting for what cost. Information technology has many applications to healthcare, and we've seen this in the increased use of electronic health records. And we'll see how IT continues to evolve and change our healthcare experience in the future. Other forces of change are ecological forces. Natural disasters and communicable diseases are examples of ecological forces which have implications for healthcare. Natural disasters such as the wildfires we saw in California or hurricanes in the southeastern United States create conditions that pose health risks. For instance, water and food may be contaminated and there is often subsequent psychological distress and other problems that arise from these natural disasters. We also see communicable, communicable diseases continue to be a threat as new strains of the flu, as well as the Ebola virus, which continues to plague places like the Congo. These communicable diseases and the growing presence of global forces in our healthcare have led to global health security funding from Congress and task forces which have been developed to think about how, in the face of globalization, we can protect populations from new diseases. Other aspects of global forces in healthcare are the increases in medical tourism and telemedicine, which enables people in rural parts of the world to get a medical consult with specialists many miles away. Lastly, anthrocultural forces refer to a society's belief, values, ethos, traditions, and experiences. As America becomes more diverse, it's harder and harder to pin down common anthrocultural forces. And at the moment, our, co our country is largely split on big policy questions such as whether or not healthcare is a right or a privilege. Here are some issues we're waiting to see play out. We don't have a single payer system. And as we've discussed, Cutting out the private sector brings up more questions than answers, but some politicians are running on this platform. So we'll have to wait and see if there's something, this is something that Americans want. And as we saw with Donald Trump's effort to repeal and replace the ACA, reforming the ACA is very difficult because 
While some people were happy to see the individual and business mandates go, other aspects such as staying on parents' health insurance till age 26 and protections for individuals with pre-existing conditions are very, very popular. Also, because many people have gained coverage through Medicaid expansion and other measures which we already discussed, it's very difficult to take those benefits away from people now that they have them. Lastly, the WHO is pushing countries around the world to create some type of universal coverage to healthcare, where people can access health services without experiencing financial hardship. While Americans definitely need universal coverage, there are still many questions about what that will look like and if it's politically and economically feasible. Thanks to the ACA, we're moving toward community-oriented primary care and a greater focus on improving population health in the United States. Unfortunately, though, accountable care organizations haven't been as successful at achieving population health improvements as we'd like, and this may be because ACOs are sponsored by physician groups, hospitals, and insurers rather than by community groups. Patient activation is a patient's skills, ability, and motivation to become actively engaged in his or her own health care. This goes a step beyond patient-centered care, which enables patients to make choices that best fit their individual circumstances. Remember that in general, medicine is moving toward prioritizing autonomy over beneficence. We'll see what new policy proposals will foster patient activation and autonomy in the coming years. Lastly, there are several healthcare workforce challenges which we'll need to monitor. There's a growing demand for nurses and a push to give nurses and nurse practitioners specifically more autonomy. In 2015, only 21 states had passed laws giving nurse practitioners full practice and prescriptive authority. Some physicians' organizations pushed back against this legislation. They were concerned that nurses are encroaching on their territory. But the bottom line is that we need more cl clinicians who can respond to patient needs, and task shifting from doctors to nurses is one of the best ways to meet that growing demand. We also have a shortage of primary care physicians, and we will need more physicians in the future to function as comprehens comprehensivists who can respond to the diverse needs of our growing elderly population who are living longer with multiple chronic conditions. In that same vein, we'll need more people working in geriatrics. Despite concerns about costs, clinical technology will continue to evolve and play a greater role in our healthcare. For instance, genetic medicine has led to gene therapy which uses genes to prevent or treat a wide array of diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, and cancer. Another growing field is personalized or precision medicine. Personalized medicine is when specific gene variations among patients will be matched with responses to selected medications to increase their effectiveness and reduce unwanted side effects. Precision medicine goes one step further and takes into account both the variability of genes as well as lifestyle and environmental factors. In the future, we will see rational drug design replace the trial and error method for discovering new drugs, which is very expensive. Other developments such as new imaging technologies and minimally invasive surgeries, which can now do image-guided brain surgery and minimal access cardiac procedures and grafts for abdominal aneurysms, these types of surgeries will continue to improve our healthcare experiences. Robotic surgery is still in its early stages, but it's also growing quickly. Vaccines have for a long time been an important part of public health and that will continue to involve, evolve in the future as new vaccines become available.
our reliance on evidence-based medicine will continue to grow. Some strategies for evidence-based medicine are listed here. Leaders must adopt evidence-based guidelines in their organizations. Systems consultation is a relatively new strategy, but is one that we recommend. Development of computer-based models, which can be incorporated into evidence-based medicine. There are also new mechanisms for auditing and providing feedback. And future practice guidelines should incorporate economic analyses. And financial incentives and provider reimbursement is something that we've now started to experience with, experiment with, but we need additional evidence-based guidance around these practices. Comparative effectiveness research is when a chosen intervention is guided by scientific evidence of how well it would work compared to other available treatments. CER could be a course on its own, but here are the seven key steps to follow when conducting CER. Future priorities for CER include the capacity to conduct experimental and quasi-experimental comparative studies as they enable us to assess causality. Evaluation of broad systems level strategies, such as benefits designs and payment reforms, and the use of evidence in the delivery of care. In summary, the United States demographic landscape, landscape is continuing to change and evolve. And that will greatly impact the future of health service delivery in this country. Also, primary care delivery still remains a major obstacle, and we'll see how we decide whether to increasingly shift tasks to nurses or if we want to try to train and disperse more primary care physicians across the country. And financing delivery of long-term care continues to strain the U.S. healthcare system, and many questions arise around the financial viability of Medicare and what we're going to do to provide care for our elderly population. And lastly, technology will continue to play a major role in public health and healthcare delivery in the United States. Please see Blackboard for any other materials. That's it for this week, and it's been a pleasure working with you this semester.